In this video, we'll use what we learned in our calculation of the average position of the particle in a box wave functions and apply it to calculating the average momentum. So we remind ourselves for the particle in a box, our wave function has a quantum number n, which starts at 1 and goes up as an integer beyond there up into infinity. And the wave function as a function of x is the square root of 2 over l, the length of our box, times sine n pi x over l. And our wave function is only non-zero inside the box for x between 0 and l. Our momentum operator is minus square root of negative 1 i, so minus i h bar, h bar being h over 2 pi. Negative i h bar first derivative with respect to x. For momentum squared, that's just applying the momentum operator twice, which gives us this operator squared minus h bar squared second derivative with respect to x. And also recall that when computing the average value of a property for a given wave function, we compute the integral over all space of the complex conjugate of the wave function times the operator acting on that wave function with the result being the average value of that property represented by that operator A in these uh, sideways brackets called the expectation value. Okay, so for momentum, we have the integral from 0 to L with respect to x. The complex conjugate of the wave function in this case is just the wave function because we don't have any imaginary parts. There's no i, no square root of minus 1 in there. So we have square root of 2 over L sine n pi x over L. The momentum operator minus i h bar d dx times the wave function square root of 2 over L sine n pi x over L. Okay, and then we can factor out some things here. Square root of 2 over L squared gives us a 2 over L. Minus i h bar is a constant. Pull that one out. When we take the derivative with respect to x, sine becomes cosine, and we take out the extra stuff multiplied times x, the n pi over l. Now we have an integral from 0 to l of sine n pi x over l cosine n pi x over l. So at this point, the integral that you want to look up would be the integral of sine kx cosine kx dx. And the value of that integral is minus 1 over 2k cosine squared kx. That's an integral you can solve by substitution. So for our value of k here, k is equal to n pi over l. So substituting in those values, we have the expectation value of momentum, our average value of momentum for the particle in a box, 2 over l minus i h bar n pi over l. Then we substitute in our minus 1 over 2k. We get a minus L over 2n pi, cosine squared n pi x over L, evaluated from 0 to L. All right, lots of stuff cancels out there in the algebra. What we're left with on the next line is I h bar over L times cosine squared n pi minus cosine squared 0, evaluating it when x equals L and evaluating this when x equals 0. Now, cosine squared of some integer times pi, cosine of n pi is either plus or minus 1 at 0, 180, 360 degrees, 540, 720, etc. Every 180 degrees, cosine flips from being 1 or minus 1. But because this is an integer, it's either 1 or minus 1. So that value squared is always going to be 1. Similarly, the cosine of 0 is equal to 1, so 1 squared is 1. So we have the same value at both of our limits here. So we get a 1 minus 1 in the parentheses here, and this in whole integral goes to 0. So that tells us that our average momentum for the particle in a box wave functions is equal to 0. So does that make sense? Well, it does make sense because it says that the particle is equally likely to move to the right, positive, or to the left, negative. And that makes sense because we saw that our average position was the middle of the box, so it makes sense that our particle is equally likely to go to the left or to the right. That makes sense. Now we can compute momentum squared, the average value of that, similar kind of expectation value integral, psi star operator psi, 
In this case, our operator is the momentum squared operator, minus h bar squared d squared dx squared. All right, so when we do this, what we get is that the derivative, second derivative of sine is negative sine, and in this case, it's negative, it's a uh, sine of kx, so that's negative k squared sine kx. So what we get is we pull out an n pi over l twice, and it's negative, so we get a negative n squared pi squared over l squared. We also pull out our negative h bar squared from our operator, that's a constant pull out our square root of 2 over L squared, two of those, gives us a 2 over L. And the remaining integral, this uh, ddx for the sine, becomes a sine again, multiply it times that sine. We get integral from 0 to L of sine squared n pi x over L with respect to x. All right, that integral, sine squared kx dx, is equal to x over 2 minus 1 over 4k sine 2kx, here where we've set k equal to n pi over l again. So uh, doing the algebra and pulling all of our constants together, we get that the average value of momentum squared equals 2 h bar n squared pi squared over l cubed, 1l there, 2l's there, l cubed, times, in parentheses, substituting in our integral, x over 2 minus l over 4n pi, sine uh, 2n pi x over l. I believe that should be. I think there should be a 2 in there. We can just jam that 2 in there. All right, evaluate that from 0 to l. Um, doesn't matter because every 2 pi, our sine is going to be 0. It's also going to be 0 at 0, so this term all goes to 0. The only thing left over is this term here. So from at x equals l, that's l over 2 at x equals 0, that's 0 over 2. So that multiplies times our constant prefactor on the outside. So this 2 cancels that 2, that L makes this L cubed and L squared. And the final result we have is that our average value of momentum squared equals h bar squared pi squared n squared over L squared. Also, you could refactor this as h squared n squared over 4L squared. And you might, this might make sense because all of our energy in particle in a box is kinetic energy. And our, our full energy expression is this expression times 1 over 2 times mass. Kinetic energy is momentum squared over 2 times mass. So it makes sense that the average energy equals the average momentum squared over 2 times mass. If you compare the values of our energy expression of, of these wave functions from previous videos. Okay, now on to the uncertainty in momentum, just as we did for position in the last video. We saw that the variance of that sigma squared is equal to its expectation of its squared minus the square of its expectation value. Notice the, where the square is on the inside and when on the outside, which is h bar squared pi squared n squared over l squared minus expectation of momentum is 0, 0 squared. So the variance is just the expectation of momentum squared. The standard deviation, or uncertainty, sigma p, is the square root of the variance. Square root of sigma p squared equals sigma p. That makes sense. So we have sigma p is the square root of this. All of these things are squared, so we're just going to take the squares away. So the uncertainty in our momentum is h bar pi n over l, which if you substitute that, you can also show that that's h n over 2 l. All right, so for n equals 1, this is h bar pi over l. For n equals infinity, this is infinity. This just scales linearly with n. So the uncertainty in momentum is proportional to the quantum number, and it's also proportional to the inverse of the length of the box. As our box gets smaller, we get more uncertainty in momentum. As our box gets bigger, we get less uncertainty in momentum. All right, so now let's look at what's called the uncertainty product. This is sigma x, the uncertainty in x, times sigma p, the uncertainty in p. This might seem familiar because you might have calculated these or we looked at them in previous videos as well as the Heisenberg uncertainty product 
of those two uh, measured values. So what happens when we multiply those two values together? So we have sigma p, h bar, pi n over l. And if we multiply that times sigma x from uncertainty in position from the previous video, which was l square root 1 over 12 minus 1 over 2n squared pi squared, the l's cancel. This prefactor remains. This square root remains. But you can do some algebraic refactoring and uh, get it to the final form that I have written down here. That's sigma x, sigma p, the uncertainty product is equal to h bar over 2 times the square root of pi squared n squared over 3 minus 2. So if we substitute in n equals 1 and solve for the numerical value, the uncertainty product for n equals 1 is 1.136 times h bar over 2. And if you'll notice, because this n squared is in a numerator, the uncertainty product for any given value of n is going to be greater than or equal to the value for n equals 1, given that n is the value, the lowest value we can have. So all values are greater than n or equal to n equals 1. n equals 1 is bigger than h bar over 2. And the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says that the uncertainty product of these two has to be greater than or equal to h bar over 2. So in fact, what we've just done is numerically confirmed that quantum mechanics agrees with the, with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in this respect. So this is important because this is the second time we've discussed the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, but the first time where we've calculated a result testing whether it comes up for our rigorous quantum mechanical model getting our wave functions from the Schrodinger equation.